Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Andre Kostin. And my name is Jonas Sarak. And today we'll present you our research called the Large Scale Analysis of Security of Embedded Firmwares. Uh, so, who we are? Uh, me and Jonas, we are part of uh, S3 Security Group, System Security Group at Uricom FR uh, uh, Research Institute. And this work was done uh, with the help and advice from our uh, professors, our Len Francilon and uh, Davide Balzarotti. Um, yeah, you can check us on s3.uricom.fr for our research and publications, academic and tools. So, coming back to, to the keynote speaker and to the examples he was giving uh, regarding the curtains, the lights, and so on. So, you could see that there are a lot of embedded devices, Internet of Things, on the Internet, connected, or so on. So basically, you could get an idea that embedded systems are everywhere, and this is uh, like a baseline truth. We understand this, we see it, we can keep seeing this. Uh, the another uh, thing uh, which we can observe is that these embedded uh, devices, which form Internet of Things and so on, they are getting smarter and more complex, so they run more complex software, they run more complex stacks, they have to support a lot of different features, they have to support different protocols, JSON, XML, and what's even more troubling, that lately they are becoming heavily interconnected. Basically, they have to be somehow remotely managed, they are being put by will or by mistake on public internet, and they're basically accessible through the dub dub dub. Uh, However, one, one important thing is that we kept seeing and we keep seeing and for sure we'll keep seeing that many, many examples of insecure embedded systems. So maybe you recall the last year's uh, edit by Joel Backdoor in many D-Link routers and this was one example. There were uh, the printers uh, exposed functionality uh, to, to the operating systems and uh, command and code execution. There were uh, VoIP IP phones uh, being affected by uh, vulnerability like eavesdropping the conversation and running code. <coughs> and recently, researchers moved to cars, researchers moved to drones, as you can see from previous talks. <coughs> and jumping a little bit ahead, we even found uh, firmware for pyrotechnic systems, uh, which is even more troubling. Hopefully, and luckily, they are not connected to the internet. Uh, so we ca could keep going for, for these kind of examples endlessly. That's why we put three periods, because if you look on the blog posts and these kinds of research, you'll see a lot of examples and how to do this. However, the, the main point of this is that all of those blog posts, examples, CVEs, or proof of concepts, like each of them is, is a result of an inv individual analysis, like somebody takes a device or a firmware and does an individual analysis, and it is, you can see that there's a lot of manual effort to describe all the steps, how they unpack, how they download, and basically they go on the same process all over again. They spend one week, one month to do exactly the same steps. So it's a manual, tedious effort, and you can see that it just doesn't scale. It works for one device, it works for two devices, but it just doesn't scale for Internet of Things, for all craziness which, which is going on. So our goal is, was back in time when we started the research was to perform uh, basically a large scale analysis to gain a better understanding of the firmware uh, problems. So basically we saw that there are a lot of problems but we wanted to understand them systematically. Basically what is the problem, what kind of problems are there, how we can uh, deal with them and what are the challenges basically in doing this. <coughs> uh, so the problem with large-scale analysis, it basically it brings several problems when you start doing this large-scale. Uh, one of them is that there's inherent heterogeneity of the uh, hardware, architecture, operating system. So you have R, MIPS, this is just a few examples, but you have then uh, 3-core, then you, can, you have CRIS, you have many others, AVR, and so on and so on. You also have operating systems or bare metal uh, embedded devices without operating systems or which fake an operating system. You have heterogeneity for users and requirements. So basically you have uh, one type of users for cable and modems at home 
and you have a totally different requirements for uh, an embedded enterprise Cisco. And basically the users and the requirements for these devices are different. And of course the security goals for each devices. If well, one thing is to consider a compromise of uh, embedded photo camera and another thing is to consider the compromise of uh, embedded backbone router. Uh, another thing is that, another problem is that a manual, as we explained, the manual analysis doesn't scale. It requires basically finding and downloading firmwares in a systematic manner. And basically it requires uh, unpacking an initial analysis. Uh, so manually it doesn't scale very well or easily. And basically many times we, we could see that the same bug is being rediscovered in different device or similar device or in another firmware. So you can see that there is a duplication of effort that some researchers took like one month to, to do research and then another researcher comes and basically comes to the same uh, conclusion and findings. <coughs> so academically, uh, there, there were several uh, previous approaches uh, to, to studying embedded devices. There, uh, there was uh, a work done oops, sorry, on, on real devices. So the authors of this work, they just bought like 10 devices with uh, very precise firmware versions. Uh, they had very accurate results. They had like vulnerabilities, CVs, but you can see it doesn't scale. So buying the devices doesn't scale budget-wise, logistically management, you have all these wires running around, you have the uh, cables. Uh, if you break the device, you have to buy another one and so on. There were another approach where people try to scan devices on the internet, basically the devices they didn't own, but you can see that it's borderline legal or ethical, starting poking around with some other people's uh, devices just to find some vulnerability. And another side effect of this is that you cannot reliably uh, verify the, the findings. So basically if the device crash or you, you find the vulnerability, you cannot re reliably uh, verify because it's on our end of the planet, except for XSS, I'm not sure how much you can really find in general. <coughs> or uh, sometimes people do even more intrusive, like if you remember the internet census where some people actually developed uh, a worm or a malware for the embedded devices to do a large scale analysis of the IPv4 range. <coughs> so some people were doing this in different manners. We approached it in a totally different manner. So we said, okay, we want to do it in a deviceless manner. So we, can, we don't need the, the logistics and budgeting problem and we can scale. And how we did it is basically we went to the internet and collected a large number of firmware images. And basically we just wanted on this entire data set uh, to perform a broad, but basically still simple static analysis. We didn't want to start porting all the uh, Valgrind and very advanced tools to all these platforms, architectures, and so on, because it's a, a lot of engineering effort. So we just wanted to do some simple static analysis. And then we also wanted to correlate across firmers because we saw that some bugs keep popping up in other firmers or embedded devices. So definitely there's a lot of, we thought that there's a lot of room and potential for correlation. <coughs> so correlating and finding links and propagating. So this, the advantage of our approach as we think is non-intrusive, it's scalable, uh, and we don't need any device. We can all, all the time uh, deploy an environment which is kind of virtual. We don't need any device. We have some limitations and drawbacks because we cannot fully uh, uh, let's say, uh, implement a device virtually, but it works for us. We can still find a lot of things. <coughs> However, many ch challenges remain. And one of the challenges, uh, the first challenge we, we faced is that, for example, the mainstream uh, systems like Mac OS, Windows, uh, Ubuntu, <coughs> they have uh, a standardized and streamlined approach towards uh, updates, right? So basically you could go and grab the deb, the page files, and you can, can see basically what the update are, where they are, they are described very well, and you can analyze them. <coughs> On the embedded world, basically, you don't have all these streamlined process. All the devices uh, update themselves in a very weird and different fashion, depending on the vendor and historical reasons. So many of the vendors just have a, an FTP site where you can go and download the firmware and then do some wizardry 
as you'll see in the next screen, or just go to register on a man manufacturer website, create an account, download, and so on. <coughs> Many times there is a hidden site where basically you need to download a particular firmware update utility, which basically connects to the hidden site, which you can sniff with Wireshark. It's not a problem, but still, it's not obvious or very straightforward, right? It's not like a update Microsoft.com or something like this. Then there's all kinds of restricted sites or request only updates or just the updates which ship only with a, with a CD when you buy, for example, the device itself. So sometimes it's really hard to do this kind of deviceless analysis if you have to, <laughs> to buy the device, right? Uh, or many times it's just one shot firmware where the firmware is intended to be only one time developed shipped and maybe the product will expire, is intended to, to be expired in one year, right? And in that cases, many times the researcher will have to go and dump the flash, the memory, the ROM, in order just to get pieces and bits of the firmware, which is another story, and, but still it can be done and then uh, analyzed. So just a few examples, let's say cameras, they will require some kind of a special file to be put on SD card, in a special format and then inserted and press some buttons in order for the firmware upgrade to start. Then there's a home set-top box. Uh, you need a special cable, a special file, a special utility, uh, a driver which will update the firmware on the device. You don't have any control or output from the device very easily except for the update utility. Uh, for, for hard drives, you need basically a, a special ISO burn on a bootable CD, then boot the CD, there's a DOS utility which starts doing some kind of funky jobs with uh, input-output ports just in order to update the hard drive firmware and so on. For printers it's even more uh, cumber not cumbersome but weird because you need to print a, a document in order to update this firmware. So you see that there's, uh, there's all kinds of weird things in this world. Uh, so uh, then the, 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 the other challenge is collecting the data set. So you can see that there is no one way to go to a, a site like abc.com and download all the firmwares or at least locations of the firmwares from the internet. So we didn't have any data set when we started the research and we had, this is very opposed to what exists in the, in the industry or other academic fields where you have a standard database or a baseline database, for example, for face recognition, for malware analysis, you have already an established database shared by the community. In the firmware and embedded world, there was not, no such thing. So we started to collect this and th that was like a challenge. So we, we collected just a small subset or a subset of firmwares available for download. So from the whole, whole population of the firmwares, uh, just part of them are available for download and from that small population we collected just a part of it which were easy to to scrap or just to spider, right? Uh, still, we don't know about many other firmwares which might be available for download or we just don't see them or they are just not available. They are somewhere on the CD-ROMs or uh, in some, some other people's devices which we just miss and because of this maybe we miss some vulnerabilities or a lot of vulnerabilities. But we'll come to that later. So that's why we actually launched the firmware.re project, which is a, a, a open, free op uh, site for the researchers, academics, industry, hobbyists, where a user can upload the firmware. Uh, maybe we'll have it already in our database or not, but we'll try our best to, to unpack, analyze, and then subsequently return some information and analysis to the user. And yeah, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Another, so another firmware is that, uh, another challenge is that, for example, there are files which are clearly a firmware, let's say this population, and let's say a Linux-based system for ARM, you can clearly see it. There are files which are clearly not a firmware, for example, the update utility, which is a Windows uh, executable, or drivers, which you are not interested, but there, this gray area, which is like, we don't know what it is, whether it's uh, firmware or not. So it's just a binary blob. It could be very well, let's say, a bitmap image. It can be just a uh, very raw, uh, bare metal uh, executable, loadable at some address. So you don't know what is exactly there unless you do very advanced static analysis or dynamic analysis and so on. <coughs> uh, then, for example, for firmware identification, as 
as I said, is um, for printers, in order to update this firmware, you have to print a specially crafted PostScript document, right? So if you have a PostScript document, you would say, hey, it's a document. Let's discard it. It's like, what can I do with it? It must not have <laughs> any firmware inside. But so with this in mind, we, we, we also have uh, these unpacking and custom formats challenges, right? That, for example, if you, we go to, to it from a real world example, we have a zip file from a printer vendor website, we download it, and inside there is an exe file and a document postscript file. So a very naive approach would be postscript is a document like PDF, we discard it, we just don't analyze it, and oh, there is an exe. For sure it's the exe which is the uh, thing which does the firmware upgrade. And if you take the naive approach, you'll go to addendum because in the end the exe will contain just the uh, printer driver, which yeah is is maybe interested for interesting for Windows uh, malware or uh, reversers, right? But for us as embedded uh, res researcher, it's not interesting. However, if you take the let's say non-naive path, and you have this PostScript file, <coughs> and you you do some more advanced analysis, and you try to unpack everything you can, in a way. Uh, then you will find that there are some uh, ASCII uh, 85 encoded streams, which are basically like base 64, but a little bit different encoding. And if you uh, decode that, then you'll find an ELF file, which uh, basically poses another challenge because this ELF file could be just a binary patch to the firmware, like which is running on the printer. It could be like uh, an update executable, or it can be the entire file system in one big uh, blob, uh, one big update. So actually, the, it turns out that the PostScript was uh, the one, the PostScript document was the one carrying the, the firmware upgrade. So you can see that there's like non-naive approaches must be taken that uh, lead to, to proper analysis. <coughs> but taking non-naive approaches poses other challenges like, uh, <coughs> uh, like uh, the firmware is, is just a blob, as, as I said. So uh, to, to analyze this blob, you would, uh, would need to do what we call file carving. So file carving is just if you have a big blob of something, you just look for very particular patterns and try to scoop out or carve, carve the thing out of the, the blob. And what it means is basically it means that you need to brute force at every offset of the file, naively, but we hope not naively. Uh, we've all known unpackers, which you hope and maybe apply some heuristics to optimize it. But again, brute forcing at every offset with all of the unpackers you have poses uh, okay, poses some 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 challenges which we'll see further. So also you need also good heuristics to stop to know when to stop carving, because you could produce a lot of false positives which are non-files, just random pieces and bits. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, so back in time we analyzed several tools. You might very be uh, well very. Uh, be aware very well about uh, Binwalk, which is a reverse engineering tool for firmers. Back in time, we chose to use binary analysis toolkit because it was uh, more uh, flexible for us. It supported the plugins and uh, recursion. And uh, again, as I, as I said, so having this uh, carving and brute forcing at every offset poses then computational limits because uh, it's carving is very CPU intensive because you have to look at every offset and execute an unpacker or an executable to unpack. And also carving results in millions of unpacked files which you have to analyze in some way or another. You have to wisely choose what to analyze, what not to analyze. And then we also want to do like one-to-one -one fuzzy hash comparison to know which files is similar to any other files. And when you have millions, one million file compared to another million file, then you have like a very big complexity. So just to give an example, if you have uh, 26,000 firmware approximately, then on one core CPU, it would take around 850 processing days just to get the comparison of each of the unpacked file, okay? And if we raise just a little bit, it's not it's, uh, four times, five times to one, 130 case of firmwares, which unpack to let's say 1.3 million files approximately, then 
the computational uh, limit raises to 150 years to to CPU one core processing time. Yeah, you can scale, but you can see that adding 15,000 more firmwares will drive this computational time basically very much. So sometimes it's even hard to scale given all this cloud and processing power available there. Uh, and the final uh, challenge is the results confirmation. Once we found, find the vulnerabilities by different uh, analysis means, uh, uh, it doesn't guarantee that uh, it's exploitable. And even if it looks exploitable, it might not uh, uh, apply to a real device. So, for example, yeah, there is, let's say, uh, an exploitable daemon, but the daemon is actually not started by etc init or etc rcd scripts and so on. Uh, and issue confirmation is difficult because it requires advanced analysis, both static and uh, dynamic. And ideally, it would require the device, the exact device, the exact firmware version, just to, to be able to confirm the, the vulnerability. Okay. I'm I'm going to take you uh, for a very fast tour uh, across the architecture of the system. So first we have the crawler that gathers firmware from the internet and uh, stores them in the firmware data store. And uh, then we also have the web interface where users can submit firmware that is not crawlable on the internet. Then these firmwares are pulled by the master node of our cloud setup and distributed to worker nodes where they're analyzed, where the first unpacked, then statically analyzed and also the fuzzing hashing of all the files in the firmware is performed. You can see that there's also an additional node here, the password hash cracker. This one gets all the password hashes from the firmwares and tries to break them and get the clear text passwords. Y you will see an example for that later, I hope. Then the results are gathered and, uh, well, there's the correlation engine that uh, compares all the firmware files across each other to get similarities between firmware. Uh, each of the components uh, I will explain a bit more in detail. So first the crawler uses multiple seeds. We used FTP index engines and Google custom search engines to find firmware, uh, firmware sites. And then we used uh, wget scripts and beautiful subscripts in case the site was a bit more complicated to download around 800,000 files, which amounts to a, a bit less than two terabyte of disk space. So this is the user interface of our website. I will show you the, 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 the website in a second. And if you have tried the website before and it didn't work, please try again now because in the last weeks we put a lot of effort inside. So now it uh, works a lot better and you will get at least an unpacked firmware if we are able to unpack it. So the unpacking process, uh, we, we took our about 800,000 files we filtered manually for something that looked uh, like interesting files. And out of those, we picked randomly 32K and analyzed them, which amounted to 26,000 firmware that we were able to unpack, uh, or 1.7 million unpacked files. On those files, we did uh, some static analysis, mainly web server misconfiguration, if we still found credentials in the firmware that allowed the manufacturer to log in, if there are links towards code repositories in the, uh, in the manufacturer's uh, site. We also did some data enrichment. For example, we took version banners. We extracted from them uh, software packages and versions that are inside the firmware. We checked for certain keywords that we knew were uh, known problems in firmware, for example, Telnet, Shell, UART, or Backdoor. And you would be surprised how much you just find by searching for the word backdoor, for example, the edit by Joel backdoor. And finally, we did the correlation with fuzzy hashes, SSL certificates, and credentials. Uh, this I'm going to show a bit more in detail. So for example, here we have one firmware with its extra uh, extracted files, and we know this firmware is vulnerable. What we do then is we look at all the other firmwares, uh, do comparison with their files, and if we see that other firmware have quite similar files, then we can conclude that those might also be vulnerable, and we need to do more analysis on them to see if they're, in fact, vulnerable to the same vulnerability. You can do the same with uh, SSL certificates that you find inside a firmware. So in this case, we have uh, SSL certificate from vendor A in our database. Vendor A is vulnerable. Then we take a public data set, namely the ZMAP internet scan of, uh, of SSL certificates. And we find the same SSL certificate inside this scan. 
and then conclude that vendor B is actually using the same firmware because it's, he's using the same SSL certificate. And then after analysis, we conclude that also vendor B is vulnerable to the same vulnerability as vendor A. So this happens because there are OEM manufacturers and they produce uh, just uh, a violation board. And then other manufacturers take these components, uh, just put in their own image and URL and name and uh, ship it as their product. So in summary, we were able to, uh, uh, to find 38 new vulnerabilities in addition to old ones we found. We were able to correlate them to 140,000 online devices and it uh, affected around 700 firmwares at least with one. And we found some funny stuff like Linux and BusyBox that is older than nine years. We found uh, passwords that were left in the, in the firmware files. Uh, we found one Linux kernel that was compiled four years ago on root uh, on a machine with public IP accepting SSH. No, and this... Huh? Four years old, but compiled recently. Okay, yeah, but compiled recently. And this is from a GPS aerospace manufacturer who should know to do it better. And uh, also the fireworks attacks. Uh, if you are interested in that, then just check out the reference in the slides uh, to, to get more information on that. So... Uh, our contributions are that we did the first large-scale analysis of firmware and we described the challenges. We showed the advantage of the large-scale analysis and uh, we showed uh, some static techniques that you can use on that. And this gives you a broader view on firmware, which not only benefited this study, but is also helping to discover other vulnerabilities. And then we can also see how vulnerabilities reappear across products or versions of firmware. And what you should take away from this talk is there are plenty of latent vulnerabilities in embedded devices. And security is most uh, often a trade-off with cost and time to market. And for some vendors, clearly not a priority. So let me give a short overview of the website. So here you see the user interface. Uh, basically, you just have a field where you can drop firmware and uh, uh, what you do is actually you take the firmware and you just drop it on this field. Wait. Uh, can you see something? Yes. Okay. So you just drop it on this field. I've prepared for this presentation that we already can go on. So you just click on the link. You get to this interface where you can put your mail address. If you put your mail address, then you will get a notification like here that uh, the firmware has been analyzed. And then you can go on reporting information, and it will display you an unpack of the firmware. Here in this firmware, we analyzed a um, Wi-Fi SD card. This is a small SD card that you can plug in your photo camera, but at the same time, it has a Wi-Fi interface, and you can access over Wi-Fi all the files that are stored on the SD card. So this SD card actually is, is, contains a small ARM core and is running Linux inside. And what you can see here, if you just double-click the, the firmware file, you can see all the unpacked uh, files in the archive, and you can see the firmware is built, has an init RAM FS, inside has uh, the whole Linux file system, and you can actually see that here there are Perl scripts, and uh, you will see in a second, uh, I will show you the CVE, that those Perl scripts are responsible for the vulnerability that uh, we reported, namely that you can, uh, that you can access uh, files unauthorized without password. So. Let's check here. Um, ah, here, okay, here you can see uh, the, the CVE for this card. And there is also a similar CVE for another card which we were able through, to find through correlation. It's another vendor, but the similar product, the Wi-Fi SD card, and he has the same vulnerability. Yes, uh, keys and passwords. Here you see the ha password hashes and the passwords that we have cracked uh, in an obfuscated way because we don't want to give them away. Still, if you guess here one star star for you, it's up to your imagination what it might be. And uh, also we just put the certificates here so in case somebody searches for the certificates, he will find our website and uh, can contact us to get more information on the firmware. So, yeah, that's about it. So, um, 
I think now was even a bit fast with, uh, with the rest. So uh, w I would like to say thanks. Uh, we both would like to say thanks to our advisors, Aurelien and Davide. Of course, to our friends and families for supporting us in our PhD. To the Secure 2014 organizers who have allowed us to speak here. And to everybody who is submitting firmware to us, because this is very important. And you should see that if you're submitting firmware to us, uh, well, on the one hand side, we get the firmware, and we're very gra grateful for that. But also, you get a report, and we plan to put uh, to release more features soon. So right now, you have just the unpacked, but we want to also give you the archive with the unpacked firmware. And we also want to put more information, like, for example, we want to put uh, more information about L files, what sh sections they contain, the string section, and so on, and file system information. So, uh, if you're interested in this product uh, and you, uh, in this platform, and you want to help us, then uh, just submit firmware, and you can also help us to to find out what you want and uh, what we can make better. And also, s thanks to you for listening to this talk. And now I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. We have three minutes for questions. Pytania trzy minuty mamy, więc dwa pytania jeszcze. We still have three minutes, so please ask your questions. Important work you are doing. My question is, uh, do you have maybe some experience with, uh, for example, medical body area network devices? For example, pacemakers for your heart controllers, etc.? No, and the problem with those is that the firmware for medical devices is really hard to get. Mm -hmm. It's not available on the internet, so uh, we, we cannot get our hands on that. Okay. It's sad. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, related to the a last question, actually, uh, have you tried contacting some of the vendors in case they might be interested in participating? participating in your study and possibly voluntarily submitting or giving their firmware for you to study? Well, we have some vendors that are interested in that, but uh, yeah, w we are in contact with them and uh, let's see how it goes along. Didn't you get in, in, into any legal uh, problems with the vendors because you are sharing their firmware on your website? So, no, we are not sharing the firmware. You need to upload the firmware, and then you get the unpack of the firmware you submitted. You cannot access any firmware on the website uh, just by, by going on our website and typing a URL or uh, looking in a catalog. You have to upload, and then you will get the report. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe just one uh, last question for me. Uh, do you see any... Particular, okay, are you able to uh, to classify the firmwares uh, um, from perspective of devices like uh, routers or uh, printers or cameras and so on? And do you see any correlation between classes of devices that the particular uh, vulnerabilities uh, just shows on particular classes of devices or rather these are common mistakes? Uh, uh, from what we saw is f first is uh, rather difficult to automatically classify by by the devices. Oh, just do it automatically. Yeah, you can use some heuristics, but it's difficult. But from what we have seen, there's nothing. At least we did simple stuff, simple things, simple analysis. And f in this simple analysis, it doesn't show that classes of devices share particular vulnerabilities. All of them have or most of them have these, let's say, web servers, and most of them have XSS. It's not something particular to, to SD cards or not. Um, yeah, then there's uh, all kinds of CGI's. Uh, the passwords are, are basically common to all the Linux-based, uh, so there was not something which stands, stands out for, for the things. Well, except for the wireless uh, pyrotechnics and firing systems, but yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Dziękuję bardzo.